Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're grateful and so happy you're joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Lunch and Learn webinar. My name is Alma. I'm the Director of Immigration Counseling and Advocacy Program at Lutheran Community Services Northwest. This is the final webinar of an eight-part series, and today we will be focusing on the Ukra Ukrainian refugee crisis. Our goal today is to provide a better understanding of one, the barriers that the Ukrainian asylum seekers and parolees are facing. Two, what makes this crisis different from the Afghan refugee and parolee arrivals? And three, the programs that LCSNW has in place to support asylum seekers and parolees in the Pacific Northwest. Our hope is that you'll come away with a deeper knowledge of the challenges and successes we're facing, as well as ways you can be involved if you're interested in supporting our work. I know that many of you already do. We have a great group of panelists with us today. Um, one, uh, Alyssa, who is a program supervisor of the Extended Case Management and Asylum Assistance Program at our Portland office and Najib, who is the Director of Refugee and Immigrant Programs at Crater Puget Sound offices, and Luba, who is a clinical manager at our Portland office. Behind the scenes, we have Carrie, Kaylee, and Jenica from our advancement team who are running tech and helping answer questions. We do have a Q&A function up and running. Uh, you will be able to find the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you think of questions during our presentation, uh, please type them into the question and answer box. And at the end, we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. So again, welcome. Now we would like to first hear from Alyssa. Alyssa, after Alyssa, we'll hear from Najib and maybe back to Alyssa after that. But after Najib, I will present and last but not least, we'll hear from Luba, who will follow me. So Alyssa, again, our supervisor, our program supervisor at Portland, if you'll turn on your, thank you, Alyssa. Thanks, Alma, for the introduction. And I am very happy to be here with all of you today to talk about this crisis um, and to better inform all of you about what's going on. Um, I would like to start with some important terms and definitions um, because there is really some important distinctions between these terms um, that will help kind of better uh, clarify some of the issues that a lot of people are facing during this time. Um, so the first is who is a refugee? And this term is defined by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees or UNHCR for short. Um, and a refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, uh, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Um, and they cannot receive protection uh, from their own country. Um, they also must, and this is kind of a key distinction is that they must cross an international border um, and we'll go into details about why that's important in a little bit. Um, another distinction is that they cannot or they are unwilling to return to their country uh, because of fear. Um, and all of the vetting for someone to get a refugee status um, happens before their arrival to their final destination. So um, for the U.S., in order to get granted refugee status, um, the vetting and the application process must happen, it must happen before they arrive in the country. Um, so that's kind of another important detail of how someone receives refugee status. Um, next is an internally displaced person or IDP for short. Um, and that is a person who fits the description of a refugee as well. Um, but they have not crossed an international border to find safety. Um, unlike refugees, uh, they are on the run at home, so they haven't crossed that international border. So that's why that, um, that definition of a refugee is, is important, and it's part of the story here for the Ukrainian crisis is because there are 
there are many refugees, but there are many internally displaced people who um, have left their homes and still remain in Ukraine. Um, the next is an asylum seeker. So that is also a person who meets the definition of a refugee um, and is already present in the United States um, and is seeking or is seeking admission at a port of entry. Um, and so the vetting for someone to be granted asylum happens upon their arrival in the U.S. So um, all of the process for someone to get a refugee status um, happens outside of the U.S., for an asylum seeker and someone to be granted asylum, all of that, the applications and the vetting process happens here in the US upon their arrival. Um, a couple humanitarian, a couple immigration terms that are also important during this time is a humanitarian parolee. Um, that is a status that allows an individual um, who might otherwise be ineligible for admission into the US to be in the country for a temporary period of time. Um, and that is for urgent humanitarian reasons. Um, typically you must file for parole, but a lot of the Ukrainian um, arrivals that we're seeing that were granted, they were just granted humanitarian parole um, at a border crossing. So many of the folks um, who were granted humanitarian parole um, came via Mexico and sought sought shelter at the um, port of entry, either in San Diego or across kind of the Southern border. Um, and one kind of key distinction that makes things really difficult for humanitarian parolees is that they are ineligible for most public benefits, um, especially in the US. So um, people who you know, have been granted asylum or people with refugee status, they are eligible for all of the public benefits um, and they have kind of a special immigration status. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the same case for humanitarian parolees. So they're left with um, not as many options most of the time. Um, and the last term that I'd like to highlight for you all is temporary protected status. Um, that is a status that is designated by either the Secretary of Homeland Security or the Secretary of State, um, and they can designate an entire country um, for TPS due to the conditions in the country that temporarily prevent um, any of the country's citizens or nationals from returning safely, um, and in certain circumstances where the country is unable to handle the return of those of those nationals. So um, just recently in the month of April, Ukraine was designated um, as a country that the US will offer temporary protected status to Ukrainian nationals that are already in the US as of, I believe it's April 11th. Um, so they were here in the US before and they're unable to return home. Um, they can file an application to receive TPS. Um, and that is a, a status that is also, it's temporary. It doesn't open up too many benefit options, um, but it does allow them to stay in the U.S. for 18 months um, without the fear of deportation or anything like that. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so quickly, I would like to go over just an invasion timeline um, and kind of the events that are leading up to this humanitarian crisis that we're in now. Uh, so it started way back in November of 2021 um, when there were the first reports of kind of unusual movement of Russian troops near Ukraine. Um, and it was reported that in late November, there were almost um, 92,000 troops present um, along the border. In December of 2021, Putin proposed limits on NATO's activities in Eastern Europe. They were rejected by NATO, but he was trying to play kind of a political game of limiting NATO's protection power over with Ukraine and in Eastern Europe as a whole. Um, in January 2022, Russian troops 
arrived into Belarus for uh, quote unquote military exercises. Um, and, you know, in February of 2022, Russia formally recognized the independence of two pro Russian breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine, which set up the um, you know, the launch of the, the special military operation a couple of days later on February 24th in Ukraine, which was the official start of the invasion. So since February 24th, there have been 5.5 million refugees that have left the country of Ukraine. Uh, so again, that's 5.5 million people who have crossed an international border and are no longer in Ukraine. Um, and almost 7.7 .7 million in internally displaced people still remain in Ukraine. So that total number, that's about one quarter of the entire population of Ukraine. So it's, it is a massive amount of their population that have been displaced in some way. Uh, many of the refugees have entered neighboring countries like Poland, Moldova, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia. Um, but some are traveling even further and some have arrived um, here in the US now. Uh, so since February, the invasion started, almost 10,000 Ukrainians have entered the country, uh, mostly via Mexico. Um, those who entered before April 25th or April 11th, well, or no, I'm sorry, April 25th, um, will be designated as humanitarian parolees. After April 25th, uh, the new Unite for Ukraine program began, uh, which will require specific sponsorship for Ukrainian nationals before they're able to enter the country. So they're not able to arrive in the same way that they, they were arriving before. Um, and very few programs are set up to serve this, this population of people. Uh, specifically humanitarian parolees, uh, because many of the, the state benefits and many of the programs that we as, as service providers um, are able to provide are contingent on people having a very certain immigration status, um, which would be, you know, refugees or asylees. So a lot of the times humanitarian parolees do not um, have that status and are not eligible for many programs. Um, so it's it's very hard for them to access a lot of a lot of benefits um, and know how to navigate the system. Um, but that's kind of where our asylum programs step in. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Najib to talk about our Welcome Center programs. Thank you so much, Alicia, and thank you, Alma, for the great introduction. Thank you to our audience for joining us today for an hour-long Launch and Learn webinar addressing the Ukrainian refugee crisis. Uh, I'm Najib Nasatian, Director of Refugee and Immigrant Services serving the Greater Puget Sound area. Uh, well, moving on to the Welcome Center. So what Welcome Center is? Uh, it's a program sponsored by uh, LIRS and LDS to provide uh, case management services to immigrants who are applying for humanitarian legal status, uh, such as asylum, TPS, or humanitarian parole. Uh, we, uh, LCSNW here in SeaTac and Portland, tailored these programs to uh, people who have applied for asylum. Uh, however, this is the best program to serve uh, those fleeing Ukrainian war at this time. Uh, the program uh, offers uh, 180 days of intensive case management uh, services, resource and referral to healthcare providers, assessed with application for public benefits and Medicaid if they're eligible. Uh, we do in-house application for work permits and limited other immigration processes. Uh, we also run community resource centers uh, that provide, you know, uh, emergency food, hygiene items, bus ticket, baby items, and uh, so on and so forth. 
Uh, and we also do, you know, a lot of resource and referrals to uh, our Ukrainian communities. Uh, as Alicia said, you know, she talked about the various uh, special terms, uh, what, you know, different status means and what some of the qualifications and what they are eligible for benefits. Uh, I would like to add that uh, in terms of uh, the legal and immigration status here, uh, there's very little to no benefits to the people who are undocumented. So that means, you know, they are not eligible to work, uh, no food stamps or no Medicaid and no cash or uh, supplemental social security income or uh, social security disability income. Uh, those who are applying for asylum, they are eligible for some uh, food stamps through state. Uh, state family assistance if there are, you know, children's, uh, but no Medicaid, no SSI, no SSDI. Uh, humanitarian parolees such as, you know, the Ukrainians who are eligible uh, to come to the U.S. as a humanitarian parolees, they are eligible for some food stamps uh, through state, uh, state family assistance. If there are children, uh, they are eligible to get their work permits. However, they're not eligible for uh, Medicaid, uh, for the adults. Uh, uh, benefit, you know, uh, for granted asylees and refugees, totally, you know, different. Uh, our granted asylees and refugees, they do, uh, they are eligible to receive Medicaid for everyone. Uh, they are eligible to get, you know, food stamps through Federal benefits, uh, TANF, refugee cash assistance, resettlement services, everything uh, that we could imagine. However, there are very little to none uh, for most other immigrants uh, who are coming in uh, to the United States. Um, since March 1st, uh, Luchin Community Services here in SeaTac, Washington has enrolled 10 Ukrainian households so far. Uh, Currently, we have 26 people on the wait list uh, who are just waiting to be enrolled into the, into the program. Uh, you know, we can't just have everybody get enrolled into the program like all at once because we just don't have that capacity. And uh, however, you know, we're trying our best to enroll these folks as soon as possible so we could provide, you know, services. Um, before March 1st, we have helped uh, 42 Ukrainians through our programs um, here in SeaTac. Uh, our capacity is very limited. However, you know, we are working very hard to increase our internal capacity to serve, you know, more and more Ukrainians uh, coming into our neighborhood and communities. Uh, and and you know some of these uh, challenges uh, involve in terms of you know fundings and grants to support our work. So that's where you know most of our donors, funders, and uh, people that we work with uh, to support our uh, work. And uh, in terms of enrollment process, uh, we have a referral form, uh, which you know people who are interested into joining our program could request uh, those referral form. Uh, I could put my email address in the chat or Alicia could also put hers in the chat. Uh, people could uh, request that referral form. They could fill it, send it to me, and then uh, we could have the program supervisor reach out to the family and then uh, enroll them into the program. Um, and, uh, yeah, that is it from my end. I, I'll pass it to Alicia uh, so she could give some Portland specific updates. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks, Sanjeev. Um, so in Portland, we are actually facing very similar challenges, um, both in our ability to serve clients because they're, you know, as Najib said, there's not a lot of um, benefits or resources that are available specifically for this population. Um, you know, there are many clients that we have that are in need of medical care or food benefits um, or 
um, rental assistance that they're just not able to, um, they're just not able to access those things. And we have a very limited capacity on, um, you know, the direct assistance that we're able to give out to folks. Um, currently, right now, we have 15 cases enrolled in the program. And that is, um, I think, about, I want to say, over 20 people, um, families included. And our wait list at the moment is um, over 40 people on the wait list. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how many um, folks in total that would be. That is just 40 cases. So we are, you know, overwhelmed with people needing assistance. Um, but then the, the hard part about it is that the assistance that we can give them is not all encompassing like we would wish it, it was. Um, so the enrollment process for us would be for, um, you know, a, a client or a, a rival or any asylum seekers really um, to reach out to our asylum services PDX email. Um, and I can also put that um, in the chat in a little bit, um, but they can reach out. Currently, the wait list is long and we're not able to um, reply to everyone that reaches out, but we we have a priority wait list running. So we have to um, prioritize because of the number of people. Um, we have to prioritize our wait list based on if they're families. Um, so any cases with children, we prioritize those cases. We prioritize um, cases with no U.S. tie or sponsor. So if they're arriving here on their own um, and don't have a support system in place. And then we are also prioritizing cases with urgent medical, um, medical needs. So if there's, you know, someone in the case that needs to see a doctor right away or they need um, certain care, we want to make sure to enroll them as quickly as possible so we can get services started for them. Um, so during the referral process, it's really important for um, sponsors or anyone helping or the clients themselves to elaborate on their case um, and provide information of how and when they arrived in the U.S. because um, that's all important information so we're able to, to sort through and make sure we're getting those priority cases enrolled right away. Um, yes, and so I think that's it for Portland. Um, I'll pass it back to Alma for the next part. <clears throat> thank you, Alyssa and Najib. Uh, thank you for uh, your information. Um, my, my part is to explain what um, specifically our immigration uh, department at LCSNW, what we provide. Um, it's while Najib and Alyssa do provide some social services for the gap measures of uh, these parolees and asylum seekers that really don't qualify for many benefits like the refugees, the immigration department, what we do is try to provide um, a, a permanent safe haven for all immigrant families. Uh, we're providing pathway to permanent legal status, which includes US citizenship and permanent residence or green cards for these families. Since 2000, uh, July 2020, during the height of the pandemic, our immigration department has filed over 830 citizenship applications and over 800 green card applications and visas. We also been providing, um, we provided um, asylum protection, especially from those, for those from Ukraine. One specific Ukrainian family we're currently representing had to escape their beloved Ukraine because the, uh, the father had volunteered uh, to provide food, water, and medicine, uh, and including clothing in Eastern Ukraine. And his family and himself, they were threatened uh, to be eliminated. Now this Ukrainian family, they had to leave behind their home, their businesses and their beloved country, Ukraine, and they come and seek help, not only for social services, but to provide a, a permanent legal status in the United States. Uh, uh, next slide. 
Now there's two sets of Ukrainian uh, wave um, that have come or will come. The first wave that we had are people that the Ukrainians that came through Mexico. Uh, these Ukrainians are pro din They're not refugees or asylums, uh, asylees, but they're pro din for one year, which is common for those who come in from the southern border. They qualify for a work permit for one year. During that parole status, uh, they may have to pay up to $495 per work permit unless they qualify for a fee waiver. Right now, the current processing time for a work permit uh, because not only during the pandemic, but just the, con uh, the, the regular processing time can take over six months or more. Um, the, the, the government has said that they will provide expedited process for these Ukrainian cases, including the work permit application. Uh, but still, um, that might limit the amount of time their work permit be valid, uh, especially those who came through the Mexican border. Uh, we talked about this in length uh, from Najib and also from uh, Alyssa, but the ORR benefits, uh, they include TANF uh, or refugee cash, assist cash assistance, Medicaid or refugee medical assistance or refugee social services, including employment and et cetera. But parolees that are coming from Ukraine, from Mexico, or even from Uniting for Ukrainian, Uniting for Ukrainians, that program, they will come as parolees, not as refugees, nor as asylees, and they do not currently qualify for ORR benefits. However, through some exceptions, we need to be vigilant for these parolees because they may qualify for state benefits. Washington State may have benefits that are not available for, refugee, for parolees generally, but they may have some exceptions. And even ORR benefits may be available. Right now, the US Congress is in the process of presenting and passing a Ukrainian supplemental bill, which will provide $1.2 billion for ORR benefits for these parolees. Uh, next slide. Those Ukrainians that will be arriving in the future under Uniting for Ukraine, they will be paroled in most likely for two years, uh, not just the one year those paroled in from Mexican border. Uh, but they will be also qualified for a work permit for two years. Uh, they may have to pay the same $495 per work permit or unless the government waives the application fee or they qualify for a fee waiver. Again, these are just to get them started and to have a work permit to find jobs, to get situated in the United States. This does not lead to a permanent status or even US citizenship. Another option for these uh, Ukrainians may be temporary protected status, which has been uh, uh, discussed previously. But these are only available to those who have been in the United States on April 11th or before. These will not include those who are coming afterwards, unless the US government changes that. And again, the TPS is currently set to expire on October 19, 2023. And so there, there is currently no protection after that for TPS. Well, unless again, they do extend the TPS protection past October 19, 2023. Those who do not qualify for TPS um, may seek a more permanent protection through asylum process, but the asylum process is not very simple. At a very minimum, they have to retell their traumatic stories to relive their own humanitarian, own, own stories of what happened to them and have to go through a three or four hour asylum interview. If that's not enough, they may also have to go through a deportation process, which can last several years. The best option for the Ukrainians really is for um, what they're trying to do with the Afghan parolees is to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act which will allow these parolees to adjust or apply for a green card. This is something similar that will need to, needs to be, happen for these Ukrainians, those parolees that have been paroled in, that they will be able to adjust or get their green card through the Adjustment Act. I'm hopeful that this will uh, be in the discussion in the near future for the Ukrainians. 
again, this Ukrainian crisis, like the Afghan crisis, may take many years to resolve. My experience uh, from working with these parolees and with asylum seekers through many years is that they're grateful human beings deserving of protection and compassion. They're extremely resilient. Uh, they're families that come as sometimes single mothers with children, and complete families of husband, wives, or children, or even just children by themselves. I know that they will bless the lives of the Pacific Northwest and the United States through many generations to come. I'm so grateful that I get to help in a small way with these uh, Ukrainian parolees and also the other uh, humanitarian crises that are happening. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to pass the time to Luba, uh, who will um, present. Luba, if you will turn your, uh, your camera and your... Um, yeah, uh, hello, just a second. Uh, but for some reason, I had a, I have difficulties starting video. There you go. Um, hello, and um, thank you everybody for um, coming to listen to this important information. And um, thank you for inviting me to be part of this webinar. So um, I am uh, working at Portland uh, Office of Lutheran Community Services Northwest. Uh, I am currently working in position of uh, clinical manager at our mental health program. I am a Ukrainian. Um, I came to the US uh, more than 30 years ago. Um, so I still have a family or I had family in Ukraine and um, a lot of dear friends um, and kept close uh, connection uh, with um, my um, friends and family in Ukraine. So um, it, this whole situation when it happened, when the war happened, um, touched me very deeply. And um, it has happened to um, a lot of people uh, who are similarly to me immigrated years ago um, and have Ukrainian descent. Um, so a local Ukrainian diaspora in either Washington state or Oregon state um, have activated and, um, you know, um, it raised a lot of um, support and humanity, but it also raised a lot of um, questions and um, a lot escalated some mental health uh, concerns and conditions. So we've been, um, my, uh, besides just um, working with uh, and supporting um, a lot of people in Ukraine, you know, uh, that's my night shift. I. Uh, because of the time difference, I usually shift and work with um, uh, people there. Um, but uh, we've been advocating a lot here for um, creating actually a new line of services. It's an add-on services. The way we approached Ukrainian population in the United States before um, in terms of providing uh, all kind of services, we kind of captured them under the, the big Slavic umbrella. And right now, um, due to the current situation, it's um, actually uh, anti-trauma informed. So we're trying to use trauma informed um, care to um, build our services on this principle and model. And uh, so one of the first and most important um, uh, principle uh, in uh, or component in this principle is to establish safety. So for either um, Ukrainians who are here or new Ukrainians who are coming in, um, to they, they need to know that there is a um, recognition and validation of their cultural identity. 
because when they're coming in and they feel like they have to continue, they are continuing to be called Russian speakers or Slavic, um, that um, sets them into uh, continuous um, fighting or trauma mode. Uh, so they feel like they will have to continue to prove to the world that they are um, Ukrainians and they um, are um, need to uh, fight and they continue to fight for their sovereignty. So this is one important consideration where we need to um, develop this new line of services that um, are serving particularly Ukrainian um, people, uh, either uh, stakeholders that uh, already live here or the new um, arrivals. So um, we, um, I'm gonna try to be mindful of the time. Um, we did a lot, we um, advocated with um, local Oregon Health Authority, so um, particularly Care Oregon to uh, provide us funds uh, additional funds, and we're trying to hire Ukrainian-speaking uh, clinician and Ukrainian-speaking uh, um, peer support specialists. We do have applicants, and we actually have applicants that are still in Europe right now. They're looking for a job. These people are not um, here to um, try to lodge on um, any kind of services that people really want to help and want to be and like coming ready to uh, work. So um, it, with specialists, it is difficult because um, there's, you know, we were not ready for it. There's not too many clinicians who are working hard to um, authorize or expedite work permits for clinicians that are um, have Ukrainian um, psychoeducation that will help with us with our crisis. We established very strong partnerships with uh, local Ukrainian community organizations. We developing um, and actually starting to work with culturally specific groups. Um, to um, support uh, for adjustment support. We held two therapeutic events for Ukrainian community using Ukrainian arts um, and um, traditional arts and culture. Uh, fortunately for us, the Ukraine has incredible history and incredibly uh, deep and um, like beautiful, beautiful uh, folk culture. So we've been um, using it with Lutheran uh, already spent probably close to six or seven hundred dollars just to uh, buy supplies for those events. We collaborated with um, our therapy program um, that provided volunteer art therapists that were handling this event. First event we had um, about 30 people attending and second event we had about 70 people attending. And um, because of that, we do have a lot of referrals. People do trust Lutheran community um, services. They know our service because of uh, the work uh, that has been done uh, by our immigration or resettlement department. And now they we're really looking forward to um, asylum support. Um, so um, we are using some of the funds from um, Care Oregon to establish um, medical um, services for uh, us uh, as asylee who have not, who just in the process and um, who need to pay like another $300 in addition to um, get work permit money, another $300 to get um or medical exam to even start the asylum application. So I'm gonna um, close up. There are a lot of um, questions, a lot of things happening. We're doing a lot and um, we, yeah, I'm welcoming all of your questions. There's my email, thank you for posting it. Um, it's lgonina at lcsnw.org. Uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.
Thank you, Luba. Um, again, I want to thank not just Luba, but Alyssa and Najib for their presentation. Um, uh, it, it's tremendous. Uh, thank you. Um, now, actually, I'm going to ask uh, all the panelists to uh, turn their videos back on for the Q&A uh, &A function um, and go through the questions. We do have some pre um, uh, pre-submitted questions and also questions throughout this presentation or, or the webinar. Um, I will read the questions and then I will present it to some of the panelists um, and then go one by one as much as we can uh, for the remaining uh, time. So uh, one, I think I would like to start off with this question, I think maybe uh, for Alyssa or Najib. It says, the question asks, uh, please address the ability for us uh, to help finding employment for current or future uh, LCSNW refugees or parolees. I'm assuming they might be asking about the future Ukrainian uh, parolees that are coming in. Uh, if Najib or Alyssa, would you address this uh, question? Oh, I, I can take that. Uh, in terms of finding employment, uh, our programs uh, work with, you know, many different employers in the area. Uh, and then we also work closely with other community-based organization who does employment services uh, and the case managers within the Welcome Center often refer clients for employment as well. Uh, it also depends on the skills of our newcomer, uh, their past experience, and also the ability uh, to work here. Uh, some of our clients who may not be able to work, uh, case managers will definitely look into finding them uh, a suitable job that uh, fits their skills and uh, expertise. And I think the other part is that we actually do have some uh, resources to help uh, these parolees. Um, to find uh, some kind of employment. Alyssa, did you want to add anything? Of course. To yeah, I just wanted to add, we have a similar kind of program in Portland as well. Um, we have an employment specialist on staff actually that would be able to um, help support these clients in finding in finding jobs and getting matched. I think the, the one kind of caveat with that though is that um, for humanitarian parolees, and folks coming in now, they do have to apply for an EAD. It is not great automatically granted with their humanitarian parole status. Um, and the issue with that is that the applications for those work authorization documents um, are taking close to five to six months to be processed. Um, and we still don't know, you know, it could be a case by case basis for being accepted or denied. Um, so that's, you know, another challenge that we're facing with this population specifically is, is the ability to work, but then at the same time, not being able to access state or public benefits. It's this weird kind of paradox of you're able to be here, but you're not able to work to support yourself, but you're also not able to uh, access any benefits that would offset, offset those living costs. So. Um, for the time being now, we are, um, you know, helping people apply for those uh, employment authorization documents. Um, that's also something that can be done online, too. So, um, I mean, it's worth looking into, I guess, um, you know, to see what the application is like. But um, that's just kind of where we are right now within, with that employment piece. Yeah, and I, I do want to add... Um, with the employment piece that as parolees, you have ancillary benefits to gain a work employment authorization, but it's not automatic. So if, when you're actually realistically trying to find a job, you show them your parolee status, it means nothing to the employer because they really are looking for the employment authorization or the work permit card. And again, um, the US government has said that they will expedite these applications um, they have done so for the Afghan crisis or the Afghan parolees um, for the most part. So hopefully these Ukrainian parolees that have come and, and will continue to come 
will be able to gain their work permits right away because um, it's so crucial. Uh, I think that's step one. And then we do have some services available to help them uh, find employment in the United States, at least in the Pacific Northwest. Um, next question, I, I, there is two sets of questions. One, in what ways can a local church support Ukrainian refugees? And there's a pre-submitted question that says, that's asking, my congregation was unable to arrange for a family to sponsor, apparently because the staff did not have time to involve congregations. We participated in the past and have funds and even furniture, et cetera, to available. I'd like to understand what the challenges were. And I, I think these questions, uh, although not very specific uh, about what um, specifically they're trying to help, one way I think they're trying to ask that question is really about, um, I think about uniting for Ukraine, uh, that, that uh, parole process that will allow um, individuals to sponsor uh, Ukrainians to come to the United States, um, which was announced, uh, was in effect last week. So in the past, religious organizations and congregations were able to do these supports and uh, most churches are familiar with that. With the Uniting for Ukraine, those people that can support uh, Ukrainians to come under the Uniting for Ukraine pro program, um, they can be either US citizen, permanent resident, you could be a, a student visa, asylees, refugee parolees, TPS, or even uh, DREAM Act or DACA holders. So essentially, if you have any legal status in the United States, any legal immigration status, I apologize, then you can sponsor someone. However, a, a local um, or a religious organization is not one of those that can be a supporter, not, not at least a primary supporter. So again, it could be US citizen, permanent residence, or other, uh, other non-permanent, even non-permanent status in the United States and sponsor these people. You will have to fill out an online form I-134, which is an affidavit of support form to show that you will be able to provide these families um, all the benefits of housing, medical, school, education, all of those things. Now, the way that the churches and congregations can be involved is that while they cannot file the I-134 as the initial sponsor, they can make their resources, the church can make their resources available to that sponsor so that they can sponsor families to come to the United States. So that is one way uh, through the Uniting for Ukrainian uh, program that the churches can be involved is that not as the primary sponsor, but as a secondary sponsor that will support the primary sponsor, if that makes sense. Um, the other question, maybe if the question is really in general, how can the churches help um, continue to support, you know, the, um, the programs that we're talking about, including what Lou has talked about, uh, continue to support the Ukrainians uh, that, we have here in the Pacific Northwest and so forth. So um, anything else, anyone else want to add to that? About I want to add that churches already supporting yes. um, the Ukrainian Baptist Church that located is in, uh, in Portland is actually been hosting uh, those families that cross uh, southern border, and they actually live in the church right now. Uh, so churches have been doing a lot, especially Ukrainian church. And, um, um, you know, a lot of, as I said, diaspora really activated and a lot of people are trying to um, gather everything from, you know, clothes and um, furniture to uh, volunteers to drive people around. And um, so it's already happening. Yeah. And, and also in our Vancouver office, um, the, the local Ukrainian church is allowing space for us to use to um, build our capacity to help apply for asylum for these Ukrainians and uh, offering that space to us. And so tremendous. And so 
hopefully I was able to answer a specific question if it was about Ukraine uniting for Ukrainians for the churches and the congregation. Again, you can be a secondary help and not the primary uh, uh, primary sponsor for these families. Um, let me see. There's another question about. Um, Oh, there's a question about why usage of the term parolee. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it is just the term that the United States have come up with, uh, a humanitarian parole uh, and parolees that are coming in. Um, I, we did not get to choose that term, unfortunately. It's just a term that um, we're we're told to use to specify. But the, the most important part is that we understand the difference between refugees and asylees and parolees because they, they have different, um, they're qualified for different benefits or eligible, eligible for different benefits. Um, uh, I had another, uh, hopefully a much more simple question for Najib. It says, how many are arriving to Washington state or Tri-Cities? I'm assuming they're asking about the Ukrainian parolees or refugees even coming. Thanks, Alma. Uh, I think it's very hard to answer that question because we don't get the numbers coming in. This many people will come to the Washington state uh, for uh, you know, support and uh, services. So I... I don't know how to answer that question, but I think uh, one way to say that, you know, our programs both here in Washington and Portland, we are ready to support as many people as possible and to the best that we could, uh, you know, uh, with as the United uh, for Ukraine program, you know, try to, uh, as, as it starts, uh, we are expecting that many people will, will arrive to the Washington state and also, uh, you know, through the other, uh, through the U.S.-Mexico border, which, you know, there are about like a couple thousand people also in there. And if they are allowed to enter the uh, United States. Uh, so we're trying to be, you know, ready and support them as much as possible. We're increasing our internal capacity in terms of, you know, the case management resource referral, you know, being able to support them with their basic needs, uh, emergency food, hygiene item, clothing, uh, some initial rental or utility assistance, and uh, these kind of costs uh, that are associated with it. Thank you, Najib. There, there is um, quite a few questions about how to find ref, uh, parolees or refugees to sponsor, uh, possibly through the Uniting for Ukrainian program. Um, and um, how, to, how to do that. I don't know a lot of details about that because the program is very new. However, the U US government has set up um, a website, the, a welcome website and, and how you can become a sponsor and also to a volunteer. I, I, it is a welcome US, uh, welcome.us Ukrainian website, uh, which I will share with you in the chat. Uh, or even, yes, in the chat. Um, that way, uh, this through the Department of State that has collabor collaborated with the US.US, welcome.US um, uh, program, which has uh, much more information about um, how to become a welcomer for the Uniting for Ukraine and how you can learn about sponsorship, how you can donate uh, or do an act of welcome now and how to get involved. There, it's a um, very uh, well thought out uh, welcome website. I will leave that, um, it is ukraine.welcome.us. I will leave that in the chat below. Um, and because I, I, I really don't know how to um, uh, set up where you can find uh, specific Ukrainian families. If you have specific Ukrainian families in mind, I think you could sponsor them specifically through the I-134, but if you're just wanting to help and don't know who you can help, I, I, I would at least send you to uh, the Ukrainian welcome.us website, which I think uh, our technical support has already copied in there. And Alma, just to add on to that, uh, 
you know, there are people who actually cross the U.S.-Mexico border and find their way all the way here to Washington State. Uh, there are families who came to us and looking for a place to stay or, you know, someone to sponsor them. So if you're able to sponsor uh, Ukrainian families uh, and house them, you know, temporarily, uh, please reach out to our office. We would be happy to have you on our list of, you know, uh, people who could support these families. And as we come across, you know, families who are in need of a place to stay, we could uh, get a hold of you. There's a question um, by Lynn that says, in Portland, what other organizations are you coordinating with and what other organization are, are working with Ukrainians who have entered through Mexico? Um, I think um, one, um, the way for just for the legal part, um, there's uh, quite a few nonprofits in Portland. There's uh, SOAR, Immigration Counseling Services, Catholic Charities, um, and uh, uh, ERCO. We're all working with not just the Ukrainian crisis, but also the Afghan crisis, just for the legal part. Uh, and others can chime in if there are other social services that we're working with also. Yeah, I would list um, those um, three. And um, as I said, community activated, there are few nonprofits. Uh, we actually have a feeling that um, people still calling us. We're trying to is design or establish um, some kind of refer information and the referral services. It's all happening and at the moment. So we're pretty stretched. Uh, but um, you can still connect with us if um, you need, like you have a specific question about specific service. So we're hoping to um, design some kind of um, resource database for uh, regarding Ukrainian uh, uh, crisis, uh, refugee crisis and uh, support that are available, but it's all in the process working. There's, there's, thank you, Luba. Um, Alyssa, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Um, I was just gonna add that there's a couple um, nonprofits that are, are helping as well. One is called Refugee Care Collective. Um, they're able to serve this population in kind of a limited capacity as an emergency resource. Uh, for the Portland area, but they are able to provide some restart kits is what they're called um, for arrivals. So um, if you can look up their uh, their website, they kind of have a list of how to build out a restart kit. Um, and this would be potentially shared with any of the refugee arrivals, uh, but there's kits um, that are around... Alyssa, you're, Alyssa, you're mute. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I had such a loud truck just go by my window. Um, but so there was, um, they provide kits, you know, bathroom kits, baby kits, um, household items, personal care items, um, and that they're able to distribute to some of our clients upon request. Um, so that's another, you know, nonprofit resource that we are kind of leaning on in this moment as well. I did have one, one addition, uh, two additional questions very quickly. I know we're end of time. There was a question about, do you know the level of financial support required for you, um, United for uh, Uniting for Ukraine program? I did share a link to everyone in the chat. Um, it's depending on how many people you're sponsoring and your your home size. The sponsor home size and the people you are sponsoring is based on the the poverty guidelines uh, for the United States. So. I did share that with you. So again, you wanna add the number of people you're, you are currently supporting yourself in the United States and however, any other additional family members um, or Ukrainians you're supporting. Um, there's one other question. This is how can an ordinary person help out besides sending money? 
Um, I think we did talk a, a quite a bit about that, about many different ways we can be helpful. Um, um, but again, thank you so much um, for all the questions. Again, I apologize if we were not able to answer all the questions um, uh, for everyone. Thank you for being with us today and for all your thoughtful questions. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any additional questions. If you weren't able to answer your questions today, contact one of the people listed in the chat. Um, and thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.